we will now proceed with the panel discussion. Special Rapporteur Joy Zelo, um, you will moderate the expert panel. I pass you the word to you now. Thank you. Um, thank you, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, the panelists. Welcome to this debate to mark the anti-trafficking day and the launch of the Swiss uh, Anti-Trafficking Week. The debate will be on the international law of human exploitation, convergence or confusion. We have eminent, very eminent panelists with deep knowledge of the subject uh, to engage with these conceptual issues around human trafficking, exploitation, slavery, forced labor. We have academics, jurists, legal experts, scholars, and practitioners above all. And I would like to introduce them to the audience and then also to explain the methodology for this debate. I have here with me to my immediate right, Professor Jean Allen, who is Professor of Public International Law at the School of Law, Queen's uh, University, Belfast, UK. Uh, he's a very published author, an international lawyer who has published in particular the, the, the book, the author of Slavery in International Law of Human Exploitation and Trafficking. Very, just hot from the press, 2013. Um, I would like to also introduce Mr. Tiago Ribeiro, who is a labor prosecutor uh, from Brazil and also a former labor judge at the Federal Court of Rio de Janeiro, as well as rep regional representative of the National Coordination for the Fight Against Slave Labor, Conathe. I would like to also introduce the only lady in the panel, Dr. Anne Galanga, who is a lawyer a versatile scholar and practitioner uh, who, through her work, have pioneered uh, the, the, the guiding principles and guide, the, the principles and guidelines of OSHR on human rights and human trafficking. She is a leading global expert on the subject of human trafficking, and she has authored a comprehensive book and the first of its kind. In the call, the International Law on Human Trafficking. Dr. Galanga, you're welcome. And finally, uh, I would like to introduce Professor, Matthew, uh, Professor Babu Matu, who is a legal expert on bonded labor. He currently teaches at law at Delhi Law School. Uh, he has been instrumental uh, in shaping India's Bonded Labor Abolition Act and is a member of India National uh, Advisory Council. Yet, so what is the relationship, uh, differences, uh, overlap, and or hierarchy between and among the concepts of trafficking in persons, uh, slavery, servitude, forced labor, in international law? Thank you very much, Mrs. Chair. Um, for me, there's clear distinctions, uh, legal distinctions. In the first instance, uh, it's clear that uh, trafficking should be considered as being distinct from uh, types of exploitation. In other words, that trafficking is a process, clearly three elements to it. It's the movement of a person, typically against their will, for the purpose of exploitation. So the process of trafficking is different from the actuality of exploitation. And so from my perspective, uh, these are different concepts and should be dealt with in, in a different manner. When it comes to uh, the issues of, of slavery, of servitude, and of forced labor, from my perspective, once again, there are three international instruments which deal with these. The 1926 Convention deals with slavery. The definition is the status or condition of a person over whom any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. Ownership is actually about control. So if we think about control when it comes to a person, 
This is what we're talking about when we talk about slavery. You control somebody to the extent that they have no agency, that they, are, they lack liberty. And on that basis, once you control this person, you can then buy them, sell them, use them, destroy them if you wish, because that person no longer has control over themselves, over their person. So for me, the definition of slavery in the 26 Convention works, it's applicable, and it has boundaries in which we can apply in a court of law and hold people responsible for issues of slavery. Servitude, I think, is very interesting because uh, international courts have struggled with the notion of servitude. What does servitude mean? But in fact, if you go back to the 1956 Convention, that, that convention was negotiated to deal with actually servitude. But for technical reasons, the, the language was changed from servitude to institutions and practices similar to slavery. So I think, and the technical reasons that originated in 1956 are no longer valid. So we should think about servitude as being those types of institutions and practices similar to slavery. In other words, debt bondage, serfdom, um, exploitive marriages, and child trafficking. Those are the four elements in the 56 Convention. Finally, forced labor. Forced labor to me is, is a very interesting concept. You have a, a 1930 convention, but in that convention, well, and the definition is such that it can have a quite wide arc, that forced labor can be in your mind's eye when people are locked away and forced to work. But it can also be the person that you bought your newspaper from this morning, who their boss says to the person, you have to accept less than minimum wage or you're fired. On that basis, that also meets force, the, the notion of forced labor. For me, one of the interesting conceptions or, or issues around forced labor is where do we draw the line in which we say that forced labor is maybe criminal and other instances where it is a labor issue. So from my perspective, there are clear distinctions when it comes to uh, the issues of slavery, of servitude and forced labor. As you can see uh, by, from this definition, from Palermo Protocol definition, trafficking persons is this process that can result in slavery or forced labor. And uh, in relation to slavery and forced labor, we have this, considering the international law, we have this definition in 1926 convention that uh, must be understood in relation to our nowadays problem, problems. And it's interesting that some, sometimes a worker can be used and controlled like uh, he, he was an object, an instrument. And, and these times we can see slavery and both forced labor. And forced labor can be understood uh, as this concept that can cover, can encompass many other uh, slavery-like practice. So I think that's interesting this, uh, to, it's, it's important to draw the line between these concepts in order to make clear everyone's obligations. Uh, just uh, because this is a debate, I, I will um, just take the position to disagree with <laughs> Professor <laughs> Elaine. Uh, not terribly much on the substance, but just to perhaps um, reiterate or, or emphasise that these terms overlap. Uh, they're not actually mutually exclusive. And that efforts to, to look at the past, to look at the various documents around the conventions of the past, can really only take us so far because they duplicate or they replicate rather than actually resolving these international definitional confusions. And we see that very clearly in relation to the definition of trafficking in persons and how states with perhaps very different agendas have been able to shape uh, very different interpretations of that definition that to us lawyers appears to be very clear. And I think that's something that we'll be picking up later on in the debate. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, I will turn to, to Professor John uh, Alien. You can respond uh, to, to this. Yeah, I, um, I said that, uh, that for me there are clear distinctions between them. But it doesn't mean that there's necessarily, that there isn't overlap. In the sense, for instance, if you look at the notion of uh, exploitive marriages, of servile marriages in the 1956 convention. It's very difficult to see in a situation where uh, a bride is sold, where a widow is inherited, that we're not talking about a power attached to ownership. 
in other, in other words, a, a conception that is, is slavery. And so um, it seems to me that, and, and also with regards to forced labor, that if you move towards that far end where someone is, is locked away and is forced to work, then other types of exploitation can come in and these definitions can also hold. That for me, the, the issue is, uh, from a legal perspective, is holding people responsible. And in a sense, it falls to the discretion of prosecutors to what extent and what is the evidence around these things. And so from, very much from a legal perspective rather than, let's say, a policy perspective of trying to shape uh, the bigger agendas. Um, so I, I will now turn to Dr. Anne Galanga, the... Uh, to, to really, uh, Dr. Ann, please, can you uh, consider w w the practical significance, if any, that the lack of uh, conceptual clarity in the international legal framework with respect to trafficking, uh, slavery, servitude, and forced labor have, especially at municipal uh, and also international levels? Uh, thanks very much, Joy. And I think that uh, perhaps the first thing to do is to acknowledge that this lack of conceptual clarity actually does exist. Uh, we do actually have a problem. And the problem has arisen after the definition of trafficking uh, actually came out in the year 2000. Before that, we knew very well that slavery was distinct from forced labour. We knew that forced labour was materially different to debt bondage. And we also knew that servitude was bad, but it wasn't as bad as slavery. And the trafficking definition, as I said, has, has muddled that. I see that there are two distinct trends. Both of them are expansionist in the very real sense of the word. The first one is the removal of the movement element from the definition of trafficking, which in effect renders forced labour, for example, trafficking. Uh, and I think we'll have a chance to talk about whether that was actually the intention of the drafters of the protocol or whether this has been a subsequent evolution that um, is supported or not by the actual text of the, the protocol itself. And the other expansionist trend we see uh, is slavery has come to be equated with this expanded definition of uh, trafficking. So, in other words, trafficking equals slavery. Now, there are multiple players in this new global anti-slavery movement. Uh, we have expansionist elements of the generally conservative law and order lobby who have really come together with the human rights, progressive uh, social justice groups into one slavery movement. And into that, of course, that mix, that, that very volatile mix, come the international organisations themselves uh, that perhaps have issues around the mandate, who is responsible for what, and definitions really matter then, because if, if forced labour is slavery, then it may actually affect uh, which organisation is taking the lead on which issue. And we see this actually duplicated at the national level, for example, in the US where the Department of Labor and the, the State Department have had um, great discussions over trafficking and forced labor and the relationship between the two. And I think that the problems wrought by this kind of conceptual fusion, confusion is actually, that's one of the reasons that we're here. The UN, its member states, and many of us working in this area are rightly worried about the fluidity and the permeability of these key definitions. Now, in terms of the consequences of confusion and exploitation creep, uh, I really think that this remains to be seen, where it's very early days yet, and particularly while uh, the law and the practice of the law is still so, so new in so many countries, we haven't actually seen the full effect. Certainly, there are reasons to feel positive and to see some, some positive uh, impacts not least the bringing of these new norms, these new very strong norms and strong compliance mechanisms, both international and unilateral, to bear on a set of practices that have long been ignored or marginalised by the international community, including by the international human rights community. And it's also been focusing attention on exploitation uh, 
which is really at the core. That's actually what we're talking about today. We're talking about people being exploited. So this expansion um, has actually allowed us to focus more directly on that. But I do think we need to be aware and uh, highly mindful of the potential negatives and the risks associated with this. First of all, a risk uh, of a dilution of attention uh, and efforts. There's really a chance that this expansion will deflect attention away from the worst forms of exploitation as we try to, to deal with everything as quickly and completely as we can. And perhaps uh, this is something that may well come up again in the debate, but there is a chance that this expansion will re really obscure the reality that of the link between migration and vulnerability to exploitation. Uh, and the role that problematic migration policies play in feeding into trafficking. And then, of course, I have you know, broader concerns as an international lawyer. Uh, I think it's, it's not unreasonable to suppose that for some states, vagueness and imprecision uh, can actually be welcome. Uh, it, it prevents the articulation of very specific obligations and it prevents uh, the kind of concrete measurement that allows one to determine a violation as clearly as one would like. So for international, international law, and I think right down to the national level, we see the need for precision. It's not just something that should be the obsession of the lawyers, uh, it's something that we should all be very concerned about. In my context, bonded labour, we have within our statutory framework three stages. The first stage is to identify, the second stage is to release, and the third stage is to rehabilitate. And we find that the legal missionary is happy to do the first and the second, and will run away from the third. And in recent days, I begin to feel that international pressure, is for you to mention from where that may be originating, seems to emphasize more on prosecution. And some of us in that context are very reluctant to move away from rehabilitation to prosecution. Uh, a bonded labourer belonging to the Dalit caste in India does not want the prosecution of his master. He wants to be rehabilitated in order to lead a decent life. Now my question is my uh, anxiety to find uh, you know, uh, information and knowledge on this is in terms of definitional categories, does uh, definition have a role to play vis-a-vis -vis rehabilitation, for example? Why is there a movement towards prosecution rather than rehabilitation? Some of us are clearly opposed to it. Thank you. I, I think that's it, because if you look at the conceptual uh, clarity uh, or, or confusion directly impacts on the identification, uh, prosecution, uh, punishment, and then importantly in terms of addressing vulnerabilities and, and then uh, providing redress or recovery for, for victims it, so that they are not uh, re-victimized again. But I, but I think maybe, uh, do, you, do you have something to say, John? Okay, yes, okay. Thank you. Um, for me, I think the, the interesting element is that, uh, that between trafficking and exploitation, that there's been an emphasis on states on passing trafficking legislation at the expense, I think, maybe of forgetting about the exploitive legislation, that there is trafficking legislation that, for instance, talks about slavery, servitude, and forced labor, but there's, it's not necessarily so that states have also put into their domestic legislation uh, that deals specifically with and defines these elements. So I think there, there's, there are issues around that. Some of the practical uh, significance of a lack of conceptual clarity, it seems to me, is that when states have introduced trafficking legislation into their domestic system, very few states have actually uh, introduced the same legislation with regards to what is considered trafficking. And, and Anne has already mentioned that uh, by removing the movement part of it and calling it trafficking, you're actually talking about something different. And in fact, so there's only three states, the Bahamas, Liberia, and the Philippines, that have introduced word for word uh, the Palermo definition. 
But even that, if you dig down a bit further, the Bahamas, in one of the elements of one of the types of exploitation, sexual exploitation, it adds uh, that sexual exploitation should be understood as, and it gives a number of examples, pornography, uh, prostitution, but other sexual activities having been subject to the effects of narcotic drugs. And so what we see here is, is a kind of uh, a different understanding of what trafficking is. There's other examples, many other examples, uh, sexual tourism, illegal adoption. This is from various countries, uh, farm labor, debauchery, sexual assault, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The practical implications of this is that the trafficking pro uh, Palermo Protocol was established to ensure that there was cooperation across states in criminal matters. But when it falls to issues of jurisdiction, for instance, of extradition, it's very difficult when you're trying to extradite somebody when the crime is not the same in both countries. And so I think that's one of the fundamental uh, different practical significances of a conceptual difference in, in, uh, in trafficking. Thank you very much. Uh, I will give you, uh, Dr. Anne Galanga, you have one minute right of reply. Okay, <laughs> right. Very quickly. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I think the, the question about uh, victims and whether victims qualify for assistance, that's actually and I think very clearly been part of the push to expand the definition of trafficking because as states start to develop regimes to support victims of trafficking, uh, it becomes very important, particularly for the activists and for the victims themselves, that the category of victim uh, is sufficiently broad enough to enable people uh, who need help to access it. So that's been one of the pressures. I'll, I'll just finish this particular question, I think on a positive note, because uh, states, I feel, um, have been perhaps a little bit more pragmatic uh, than many of us working at the international level in getting around this conceptual confusion. And it is, of course, very true that um, most states have not uh, adopted word for word the trafficking protocol definition. I think that's a very, very wise decision for states to make. And definitely we start to see, as we see the second and third generation of trafficking law, we start to see a much more sophisticated approach to understanding of trafficking that, for example, brings in related offences. So I spend a lot of time working with countries on revising their laws uh, and more and more what we're encouraging and what we're seeing is states keeping the definition of trafficking and this idea very clearly, but also making sure that they have very effectively and very clearly criminalised forced labour, forced marriage, and the, uh, the offences that are associated with trafficking, and most importantly, offences that are often much easier to prosecute than the very complex crime of trafficking, and that might be something else that we'll be talking about a bit later. Exactly. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I, I will now uh, move quickly to Professor Babu Matthew. Uh, given your background uh, and your expertise, uh, what can be done to, to clarify the existing uh, international legal framework uh, with respect again to trafficking, uh, slavery, servitude uh, and forced labor, uh, as well as states' responsibility uh, under these uh, international standards? Uh, what role should in particular be played by, by the courts, uh, other supervisory or monitoring bodies, or even international organizations in, in this regard? I must be honest and confess that uh, my own understanding on this is still at a very early stage of evolution. Partly because I come from a jurisdiction where human rights has developed its own jurisprudence. And so far as the achievement of remedy is concerned, we rely much more on our national jurisdiction. And therefore, there is no compelling reason to search for international support, given its inefficacy. Having said that, uh, I must still welcome this whole tremendous effort and share a few related things. I find the idea of a continuum a very interesting idea. I've come to know more about it as part of the preparation for this occasion. I, th I understand that in France and in Brazil, the notion of continuum is present and that in Brazil, uh, you know, almost everything in this broad category is treated as close to slavery. Uh, I come to the Indian position. Slavery, part of it is dealt with under the Indian Penal Code. 
And that's the criminal law of the land. That's the substantive criminal law of India. Not surprisingly so, because it was Lord Macaulay who prepared it in the year 1860. And that remains on the statute book. Uh, and it attracts various forms of punishment. But I think where I can uh, raise some interesting questions vis-a-vis -vis international law is relating to what we call bonded labor. And here, I must mention that it is the Indian variant of slavery. And I think that has its own sociological implications. It is embedded in the caste system of India. It is sanctified by the Hindu religion. It is not less than 3,000 years old. It's closely interwoven with the division of labor. It's deeply embedded in the agrarian system of India. It's related to the division of labor, unclean jobs, removing the dead carcass uh, of an animal, cleaning up, and uh, agrarian labor or agricultural workers. Uh, it's part of feudalism, and it's aggravated by poverty and social exclusion. It's uh, hugely practiced against the Dalit, and if it's a Dalit woman, it's a double oppression. Children of Dalits continue to be discriminated. You know, one of the founders of the anti-caste movement in India is the one who led the constitution writing process. His name is Dr. Ambedkar, a Dalit himself. He uh, was quoted, or was, is known to have stated, I was born a Hindu, but I will never die a Hindu. And that's the extent to which he thought that the Dalits cannot liberate themselves so long as they are bound by Hindu philosophy and theology. And therefore, he actually converts himself into Buddhism. And that will give us a peep into what are the sociological dimensions of what we are talking. Now, if we look at forced labor as recognized in international law, it appears to hinge around the notion of the menace of penalty. Uh, you know, and if I, if I were to relate to that, uh, then I would find uh, that the other limb in international law is any work that a person does uh, for which the person has not offered himself voluntarily. So this question of voluntariness, this question of force, the Indian contribution to this, this aspect is referred to as the Asiad case. That is a Supreme Court judgment by a leading judge of the Indian Supreme Court. And uh, that is uh, something which has held for the last 30 years. I doubt it will ever be reversed. Such a powerful judgment it is. And this uh, depends upon the interpretation of our constitution. In the constitution, we have a fundamental rights chapter. And there are only two fundamental rights which by constitutional law are made into punishable offenses. One is the offense of untouchability and the other is the offense of begar. Begar is an Indian word that's been added to the English dictionary. Begar means extracting work without any payment. And therefore there was a debate in the Supreme Court where the partial payment will mean that it is not forced labor. And the Supreme Court rejected that argument and laid down that non-payment of minimum wage will be equal to forced labor. And then the question is, you know, what is free choice? If a person is compelled to sell his labor on account of poverty, on account of hunger, on account of starvation, on account of inability to lead a life, if those circumstances force somebody to sell labor, and that might apparently appear to be voluntary, but it's not voluntary, it is forced labor. And I think this aspect may be something which is useful uh, for us to consider even in terms of uh, international law. Uh, I think it's actually a wonderful question to ask what the uh, can be done to actually clarify the existing international legal framework. I think for me, first and perhaps most importantly, we probably need to be pretty rigorous in separating advocacy from the law. We need to accept that terms such as slavery and modern slavery will continue to be used fairly promiscuously by advocates, but that shouldn't distort the law. And 
international lawyers and I believe international organisations have a very special responsibility in that regard. It's actually quite uh, tempting to the lure of simplifying the complicated and broadening perhaps one's appeal is a very strong one, particularly in this current climate where there seems to be perhaps that that's the only way to attract attention and funding. But we do pay a high price for that uh, and we should be brave enough to to confront initiatives that, that perhaps undermine, undermine or further confuse the law, whether they come from a government or from a private corporation or anything else. Uh, what specifically can we learn from development of national law that could help shed light on how to understand the relationships between the concepts of trafficking, slavery, forced labor, and, for, and slavery and forced labor? Brazil's example um, reveals this attempt uh, to develop uh, a definition that, um, besides trafficking persons, a definition that encompasses um, many uh, forms of labor exploitation. We have, in, under Brazilian law, this crime of uh, reducing someone to a condition analogous to that of a slave, uh, with a very uh, detailed definition, and uh, with this definition, we can encompass uh, slavery, we encompass forced labor, uh, debt bondage, and many uh, so-called uh, slavery-like practices. So uh, I think this, this attempt to develop a, a concept that can make it clear uh, what situations can, can uh, reveal the existence of forced labor and slavery-like practice is uh, an important contribution uh, to, the, the, to shed light uh, in relation to this concept, and maybe the same thing can occur in other states by uh, the, the development of a, a context, a concept that is related to local context and maybe can uh, help the, 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 the achievements in relation to the combat against uh, forced labor and slavery-like practice. I think f what I've learned from ha having examined uh, the domestic laws with regards to trafficking, slavery, etc., is that when it comes to slavery, servitude, and forced labor, that the legislation that's in place uh, is limited. Oftentimes states only have provisions, let's say, in their constitution, but they don't expand on it. Um, and you get, you get a real sense uh, that there was an introduction of these things, let's say, around the time of the universal uh, declaration or around the, the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So you have this legislation that comes in, in, in waves. For me, and I think maybe uh, to be, a, let's say, a bit uh, to challenge uh, my, my, my colleagues uh, and to, to raise uh, an issue, I, I think that uh, I mentioned before that with regards to trafficking and exploitation specifically, that there's been a number of, of different readings of what exploitation means. So there's been a real divergence. But I see another trend, and I think it's a trend that's, that's rather interesting. And that is that, for instance, the, the European Union, in its 2001 directive, puts forward this notion of the movement of a person against their will, so trafficking, but for any criminal, with regards to any criminal activity. And that may be the future of the definition of trafficking that we don't seek to establish what exploitation is. We accept that anybody who's forced to do something against their will, which is illegal, and which has movement attached to it, meets that definition of trafficking. So it may be that there's convergence at the end of this process, that there has been uh, an attempt in each country to define what trafficking is, and uh, each country has come up with a different understanding. There may be this umbrella concept which catches much of it, and that is that any criminal activity in which a person is coerced into, when there's movement, might well meet the definition of trafficking. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so I will take one more minute before we move to the next uh, segment, giving you, of course, the right to reply. Yes, uh, Dr. Yeah, just very briefly, I don't see that happening. Um, I think that what, what we are seeing very much is that states are playing around with the issue of movement and in fact more and more not requiring movement but rather focusing on the end purposes uh, of uh, which are the exploitation themselves and perhaps that ends up coming pretty much to the same thing. But I do believe very much that the, the trend will be away from 
uh, focusing on movement, and that may well be problematic. We can talk about that, I think, at some point, uh, which uh, is, is a big part of the definition, and very much skipping, even perhaps skipping over the means element and going straight to the servitude, the um, particularly forced labour, forced marriage, and these end purposes of trafficking. So the trend that I see is, in fact, um, that the end purposes of trafficking are starting to become trafficking. Uh, and that's very significant uh, legally, but also in terms of policy, both at the international and the national level. Thank you. Uh, is, is trafficking in person a form of exploitation? Or is it a process that may result in exploitation? Uh, where would that fit in, in the continuum of, uh, of exploitation? I think a very interesting question, uh, whether trafficking is a form of exploitation or it's a process that results in exploitation. Legally, um, you don't have to be exploited to be trafficked. That is, uh, that, uh, that if you are seeking to exploit someone and you, try, and you move that person and through deception, etc., then that can also be trafficking. But I think that's, that's in a sense, a lawyerly answer because it will be rare that this will take place. I think that trafficking is exploitive because behind that is the acknowledgement, the realization that when somebody is trafficked, it is violent. The person does not want to move and they're being moved. And they're being moved in a sense towards exploitation, something they don't agree to. As a result, uh, the trafficking process is probably the most violent and it is, if you wish, in, in quite harsh language, it is the breaking of a person so that they can then be exploited. So I do see that in, on the one hand, you could say, well, no, it's a process that leads to exploitation. But to my way of thinking, we should not deny that the process of trafficking itself is exploitive. So the first. The second is the issue of a, of a continuum. I think we've discussed it in, in many ways already of, of this continuum and that there's overlap. Um, and, but there are clear reasons why uh, slavery was outlawed and then forced labor and then we've seen uh, different types of, of exploitation being, being dealt with. Um, for me, the, the issue of a continuum may fall rightly with regards to the penalties that are attached to it. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I don't see all that much leverage, legal leverage, in talking about a continuum. I'm a little disconcerted to agree with uh, Professor Elaine again, um, but I, I, would, I would pick him up on one thing, and that is the continual use of the word movement. You know, that trafficking is a process moving someone into a position of exploitation, because unfortunately that doesn't resolve one of the central questions that we're here to talk about today, uh, and that is the very strong argument that continues to be advanced that maintaining a person in a situation of exploitation is trafficking. And that is the exploitation creep uh, that uh, has, I think, many people, many organisations quite rightly worried. I think for me, the interesting thing and the thing that we, we often forget is at the international level, the, the plural protocol is exactly that. It's a protocol to uh, a, a convention deal with, dealing with organized crime. And so the, the conception of trafficking was the movement by a criminal gang. And that, that movement ended when the criminal gang was no longer involved. And so you could clearly make parameters around this person left here, these are the people that assisted, and then that person was exploited. But I think that's been lost uh, when we move to bring the legislation into the domestic legal order. And I think that's where uh, what, what was conceptually quite strong has kind of broken and, and fragmented uh, into, into the understanding and maybe the, the issues and the problems that we're seeing today as a result of the domestic implementation. Conceptually quite strong at the international level, but it's been lost in translation as it's been brought into the domestic legal orders. Uh, what is the meaning of the term harboring in the trafficking definition? And how do you think the drafters of the protocol uh, understood this term? If it operates, uh, does it operate to bring both the process and the, and the end situation of trafficking within the definition as you have written particularly in, in your book on international uh, human law, tra international law on human trafficking? 
uh, again, it will be interesting if you look at what are the legal and functional limitations uh, to this. Okay. Um, I think that perhaps the first thing to say is that harbouring is problematic. It was actually identified by the conference of parties to the to the protocol to the convention as a, an area of potential uh, study. Uh, in this broader study of, of complicated and complex concepts in the definition. Now, it's not least problematic because this, is, this term is usually used to refer to contraband or criminals. Uh, and it's only really in the context of trafficking that harbouring has been used uh, with reference to victims of crime. And that's, that's perhaps something interesting that we could... Um, explore a bit further if we had some more time. But leaving that aside, this becomes an issue of treaty interpretation. The US government, for example, has argued very strongly that inclusion of harbouring and receipt uh, within the act element uh, of trafficking in persons um, extends the definition of trafficking to cover situations in which someone has not been recruited or moved into that situation by a third party. So, for example, a person who's maintaining control over a bonded labourer has, in fact, trafficked that person because he or she is harbouring them through one of the prohibited means for purposes of exploitation. Now, the most direct effect of this and the effect that has, I think, uh, many, um, many governments and, and international organisations worried is that this brings all forced labour or bonded labour within the definition of trafficking. Forced labour, in fact, is trafficking under this interpretation, as is forced marriage, debt bondage, and most of the other forms of exploitation to which trafficking has been linked through the protocol. Now, I've accepted previously in, in my work that this is indeed a possible interpretation of the international definition, but the problems attached to that interpretation are quite clear. And I think we do need to acknowledge, uh, it's already been mentioned a couple of times, that this expanded vision of what trafficking is seems to be pretty much at odds with what the drafters of the protocol intended. Ordinary meaning is, of course, very important in interpreting treaties, but so is object and purpose. Uh, I was actually there at the protocol negotiations and it was very clear to me that states negotiating the protocol were focusing very much on the process of trafficking. They didn't bother to go to all of the trouble of developing a three-part definition of trafficking just so that the first two parts could be rendered irrelevant. That just doesn't make any sense at all. The same argument applies to the trafficking equals slavery equation as well. Why bother to develop an entirely new treaty regime? And this is a treaty. It's called a protocol, but it's a treaty when slavery and forced labour are already quite well addressed through strong customary law and through strong treaty law. It really just doesn't make sense. Now, the second problem around harbouring is a much more practical one, and it relates to the consequences of this interpretation. What uh, a colleague of mine who writes in this area um, extensively, Janie Chung, has termed exploitation creep. The transformation, uh, as I said before, of the purposes of trafficking into trafficking. And as has already been mentioned, the consequences of this creep really remain to be seen. We can see it as positive because it's brought these new practices or these old practices into a new and quite rigorous uh, legal regime, but we can also see it as a negative, making everything trafficking, making everything slavery, for that matter, through this um, umbrella concept of harbouring, uh, risks, as has been said, diluting attention and effort and marginalising perhaps the very worst forms of exploitation that we so desperately need to be focusing on with all of our attention. Thank you. Yeah. So are you saying, in effect, that a, a situation of intergenerational bonded labor uh, involving no preceding process fall within or without the, the scope of the trafficking uh, definition? OK, what I'm saying is that that definition um, is supported by the text of the convention itself, 
but is undermined by many other aspects of the convention. It's very clear that the convention was talking about this process. It's in, the, it's in the, the preamble, which talks about countries of origin and transit and destination. It's in the kinds of obligations that were created for cooperation that actually are siloed according to whether a country is a country of origin or destination. Uh, for example, if we look at the travel preparatoire, we see the same, there was not an idea that states were in fact um, criminalising or, or creating a new treaty to actually deal with um, slavery and, and forced labour and uh, the other ones uh, that are in the purposes of trafficking. So yes, we, we have a problem here because we have the text of the convention that goes some way towards supporting this, but we also have the context and the object and the purpose of this treaty that I think undermines that interpretation. Uh, what is the relationship uh, between bonded labour and other legal concepts uh, such as uh, trafficking in persons, slavery, and forced labor under Indian law? Yeah, uh, you know, many of us, including activists, we have taken the position that the Bonded Labor System Abolition Act of India, a specific legislation, and we must take note of the importance of specific legislation to deal with various aspects we are talking of. For example, in relation to forced labor, I can identify 25 separate pieces of legislation which address particular forms. Uh, take marriage. There is the Dowry Prohibition Act. And you know, dowry is an all-encompassing social evil in India. And that cannot be addressed except by specifically targeting uh, on it. Coming to the bonded labor system, there are 31 forms of bonded labor for which the statute uses the vernacular language. Each vernacular language corresponds to a particular state. And if that form of bonded labor system exists anywhere in India, there shall be a presumption that a debt bondage is involved. This is absolutely crucial to the definitional aspects. Even I cannot understand the vernacular manifestations of it, but it's incorporated into the English uh, written uh, statute. Uh, advance, payment of advance is an important part of the bonded labor system, but it can be advance or it can be a customary social practice or it can be an obligation devolving by succession, intergenerational succession, or for any economic consideration, or by reason of his birth in a particular caste or community. And so if you include this variety, it is the Dalit, it is the tribal, it's the Muslim. And if you put all of them together, that will constitute about 37.5% of 1.2 billion people in India. How many European countries put together? So I think this dimension must be kept in mind and uh, the operative part of the definition is, is there any form of unfreedom? And four varieties of unfreedom are identified. And if any one of those forms of unfreedom is present, that's enough to drive home bonded labor. The one is nominal wages, or now we say below the minimum wage. Number two is forfeits freedom of employment. Number three is forfeits freedom to move freely. Number four is forfeits the freedom to sell his labor power. And that's the reason why minimum wages is something which is very important. Uh, I would then uh, say that, you know, we as activists have decided that we don't want an amendment to the statute. The biggest bugbear is non-implementation. And therefore, we have asked for writing rules all over again in order to facilitate implementation. The barrier is not conceptual, the barrier is implementational. And the government last week has accepted to sit with us and rewrite the rules in order to implement what is conceptually clarified. I, I will just move uh, quickly to Mr. Ribeiro and then to, to, to also ask you uh, this question about especially the concept of uh, Chabelo Escravo. Uh, 
uh, which has evolved over time, and then uh, to look at it, how has it evolved, uh, and, and how is it uh, working the concept in view of, uh, in the light of the discussions we've been having? Well, um, since 2003, we, we had this amendment uh, to our um, Brazilian penal code, and we have uh, this detailed definition of the crime of uh, reducing someone to a condition analogous to that of a slave. And this legal concept uh, gives this uh, detailed definition, as I said. Uh, it says that that's, that practice can occur uh, by subjecting a person to forced labor uh, or to arduous working days, uh, subjecting a person to degrading working conditions, also restricting in any manner his mobility by reason of a debt contract in respect to the employer, also by uh, retaining workers at the workplace by preventing them from using any means of transportation, and finally, uh, retaining workers at the workplace by confiscating their personal papers or personal property. So, uh, as you can see, this is uh, a concept that uh, do not uh, cover trafficking persons, trafficking persons under Brazilian law is another issue, but it's a, it's a concept, this, this definition of reducing someone to a condition analogous to that of a slave. It's uh, well known uh, as its reduced form, slave labor. And it's a, it's a definition that encompasses uh, forced labor and compulsory labor in a strict sense. Also, uh, debt bondage, bonded labor, and finally, many other uh, slavery-like practices that, that are literally mentioned in this legal definition. And uh, I think that this concept uh, evolved over time, and uh, I think that this, the, the main point of this evolution is, the, is that uh, reference to working degrading conditions. Uh, of course, that working degrading conditions uh, do not mean um, any a single uh, labor law fault. Working degrading conditions are that conditions that uh, reveal such a, a serious uh, violation of human dignity, uh, a disregarding of the human condition, uh, the situations where the, the worker is being treated like an object, like an instrument of the employer, uh, of course, that uh, freedom is the main subject when it comes to uh, forced labor, but uh, it's also important to, to, to be aware that uh, freedom is, is an attribute of human condition, and a worker that, for example, uh, receives no proper water, uh, is being obligated to sleep under canvas uh, on the field with no protection, he's being treated not like a human being, he's being treated like an object. And I think that this, this link between uh, freedom, free will, and serious violation of human dignity, I think that's, uh, that's the, 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 the most important note of this evolution of the concept of uh, slave labor. And it's, it's important to, to, to say that, unfortunately, we have this attempt uh, in Brazil of some, some groups of Brazil's politics that uh, are trying to review this definition, are, are uh, trying to reduce the protection of uh, this definition. And we know that, for example, uh, Ms. Gonara is aware of that, and we, we count on this support of the international organizations, and we hope that uh, that, that attempts will, will not occur, and we still have this important instrument that is the legal definition of uh, slave labor under Brazilian law. This, this legal concept really um, allowed many improvements in Brazil's practice and programs and policies, and also prosecution, mainly in uh, labor law courts. We have this uh, distinguishment, uh, we have this uh, labor prosecutions, and when we have this, we uh, claim for the so-called uh, compensation for collective moral damage. And this is, uh, unfortunately, in many cases, we, we labor prosecutors can uh, have this compensation, this, this sentence uh, that uh, impose this compensation to society. And but unfortunately, under uh, the criminal courts, we also have to improve the actions. We we still have many difficulties, 
relation to criminal convictions. But uh, I think that's, that's uh, a progress that we, we will achieve to this also. As you mentioned, Brazilian law, and nowadays um, we don't have this definition for trafficking persons for uh, labor exploitation, only trafficking persons for prostitution. And we have this crime of uh, enticement of workers, but it's not a legal concept that's uh, resolve the problem because it focuses not uh, on the protection of the victims but the protection of local economy and it has a ridiculous penalty so I mean it's not helpful and we, don't, we really needed this, this up, update of Brazilian law and because nowadays when we have a situation of slave, slave labor with previous trafficking persons we, we try to make the, the both employer and the responsible for recruitment to answer for the practice of slave labor. But actually, we should, uh, it should be possible to make the answer for both practice because there are two different violations of human rights. So uh, with this amendment, we could make the answer to uh, slave labor and trafficking persons. And that would be the first importance of this amendment and also uh, to, to put in evidence the, this other purpose of trafficking persons because uh, according to this framework uh, Brazil's uh, discussions in relation to trafficking persons are focused on the uh, prostitution and sex exploitation which uh, of course are very important subjects but it's important, it's important to uh, focus also uh, on this matter of labor exploitation and the other purpose of trafficking persons and uh, so this amendment would be very important to increase and to put uh, Brazil, Bra Brazilian law according to the st standards of international law nowadays and we expect for this amendment to improve the actions in Brazil against uh, trafficking persons especially for this other purpose of exploitation. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it's, this, uh, it's in order to express tremendous solidarity with this approach, especially for the reason that the word dignity is used. In India, the right to life constitutional law jurisprudence revolves around the word dignity. It is the fight to regain dignity which is the most crucial. The most dehumanizing form of life experience is the denial of dignity in various forms. Labor jurisprudence began with the organized sector and failed to look at dignity in this sense. It looked at it as a class issue, whereas the dignity issue is an issue of the excluded social groups. And hence, that uh, direction of traveling is very welcome under Indian conditions. I think for me, uh, an interesting uh, issue that arises from this move to, to deal, that originally deals with prostitution and then realizes that it's also about other types of exploitation uh, that's taking place in the Brazilian context at the moment is historically what has transpired. That uh, the very regime of trafficking emerges from what was called the white slave trade, but it was really about prostitution. And in a sense, the early, my, my feeling about the early attempts to incorporate the Palermo Protocol was the emphasis on uh, sexual exploitation. But that uh, in a very short period of time, there was a true realization that, the ex that exploitation went beyond it. In the context where I come from, in the UK, there's very much a shift from sexual exploitation to labor exploitation. And I think that's a, that's a healthy, um, uh, development that's transpired as a result of Palermo, that, that uh, the notion of exploitation go, goes beyond sexual exploitation to labor exploitation. Uh, looking at the concept of bonded labor, how has it evolved over time? Uh, and, and what is covered in the Bonded Labor Act of uh, India in 1966, the Bonded Labor System Act? Um, and and uh, what is the reasoning behind the recent legislative uh, uh, reforms uh, around that? W what value, what are the areas, what gaps are there that they want to fill? Uh, it's very strange perhaps to take note of the fact that this particular legislation came into the statute book during the period of emergency declared by Mrs. Indira Gandhi. 
And does that indicate anything? Perhaps it indicates that in a caste-ridden society, a legislation in favor of the downtrodden social groups required emergency conditions. And that ordinance was then became law. And as I mentioned earlier, this is one law whose conceptual framework we are happy with. Uh, one interesting thing about legislation in India, and every particular social evil is addressed by a specific legislation. Interestingly, there's a corresponding fundamental right in our constitution, which is equivalent to the human rights regime. And therefore, if a statute falls short of interpretative benefit, then the constitutional law can step in, even into an area occupied by a statute, and give it an even more expansive definition. And that's the reason why there is a Bonded Labor Act has become a useful. Because a strict interpretation of the definition of bonded labor would require the presence of bonded debt. But by virtue of falling back on the constitutional law, that is overcome in order to say, if somebody is working without a minimum wage, that is forced labor, which is equivalent to begar in our condition. And therefore, that's a violation of human rights. And so it becomes expansive. And when the Supreme Court of India pronounces, that becomes the law of the land. And the statute has to be read in conformity with the Supreme Court's judgment. So if you put the statute and the constitutional law judgment on the subject, then we have no shortage conceptually. We then go back to the problem of implementation, which is rules. And rules is, strictly speaking, not a legislative measure. It's a delegated legislative measure. It's the administration and the executive that enacts rules. And I must say, our campaign has just now been successful in, to the extent that the government of India has agreed, OK, we will relook at the rules. And that exercise is on. The sixth draft of it is already ready. But I, I guess the, the one of the points to make is that if we look at uh, prosecutions at the national level for trafficking, <clears throat> we do see that they continue to be predominantly addressed towards those who have um, been moved into situations of exploitation. So we see that that migrants and migrant workers are still predominantly um, overrepresented in trafficking prosecutions. So there is still uh, some attachment to, to the notion of movement. Now, the ILO, uh, I think, has repeatedly over the years interpreted trafficking for forced labour to include only forced labour involving recruitment or movement by a third party. Uh, that hasn't been universally agreed to. And as I mentioned before, the United States, for example, using both receipt and harbouring, uh, have argued and have in fact applied in their own unilateral compliance mechanism the notion that all forced labour uh, is trafficking. Uh, as I, I did mention before, the protocols, context, the, the treaty structure and its substantive provisions do go some way to supporting ILO's focus on movement or recruitment as a distinguishing feature of trafficking. Uh, and I think that there are a number of factors, some of which I've already mentioned. Uh, the origins of both protocols, the trafficking and migrant smuggling protocols, were very much around concerns related to clandestine migration, including in its more abusive forms. We can't really get around uh, that fact, I think, particularly for those who were actually there uh, and saw where the impetus really lay. Uh, once again, I point to the preamble, which states, talks very, very clearly about the need for an international approach in the countries of origin and transit and destination. Uh, and as I said, it actually assigns obligations according to this categorization. Uh, the Travaux Preparatoire includes several indications that the de delegates were operating from the assumption that trafficking actually involves movement. And in that regard, it's really important to, to note that there was no debate around whether trafficking requires movement. The debate that relates to that during the protocol negotiations were over whether cross-border movement was required. That was the critical part of the debate, whether there could be internal trafficking. But it wasn't actually about the movement itself. 
Now, I was uh, one of the, um, the representatives from the UN agencies that were participating uh, in the negotiations for the protocol. I was representing the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, uh, at the time, and we were working very closely with uh, ILO, uh, UNHCR and UNICEF and others on trying to push very hard for this criminal, uh, criminal uh, justice uh, UN Crime Commission uh, instrument to actually include human rights. We were very clearly, and you, that's, that's obvious in, in the documents that emerged from our side, working on the assumption that movement or recruitment elements were key factors in rendering migrants particularly vulnerable to exploitation. Now, that the ACT element includes a range of actions beyond movement and recruitment isn't this is not necessarily decisive because uh, I think it can be argued quite convincingly that this reflected the drafter's intention to see trafficking as a process carried out by multiple actors working in concert. So pinpointing each act in the process was actually an attempt to criminalise all the actors involved in the process. The recruiters, the transporters, the owners, the managers. Um, and the supervisors actually of a place of exploitation, not to equate the individual parts of the process with what, what was actually the outcome. So yes, we, we have a little bit of a problem there with uh, the plain meaning of the words versus this much more contextual interpretation that brings us back again to the idea that trafficking is somehow associated very closely with movement uh, and with particularly with the exploitation of very vulnerable migrants. Uh, I just want to uh, draw attention once again to the trend towards criminalization. Uh, the government of India, for example, is very happy to include in any statute a cri criminal provision. It has become an escape route to find remedies. And I hope the international also doesn't fall into the same trap. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'll get uh, to the, the final question on this debate, and, and, and that will be to you, uh, Professor John Allen. Uh, is the distinction between slavery and servitude both distinct and qualitative? What is the added value of the concept of servitude? Uh, how are we to understand it? And, and is it something you see as a non-derogable norm of international law becoming something already that is part of customary international law? Do you, do you look at it as that? Yeah. With regard to servitude, I've already mentioned that, uh, well, let me start by saying this, is that international courts have struggled with the notion of servitude. They've been uh, unable really to, to draw parameters, I think, or parameters around it, which are viable in a court of law. So they've come as close as to say that, uh, that it is a exploitive labor. But that doesn't get us very far, and that's probably pretty close to, to forced labor anyway. So there is a, a, a difficulty, and I think the struggle has been a, a failure to realize that the 1956, the Supplementary Convention, is actually about servitudes as opposed to this, this conception that was forced on the negotiators of institutions and practices similar to slavery. Now, having said that, if you look at uh, the actual provision, so there's four provisions, debt bondage, serf, uh, serfdom, um, servile marriage, and child trafficking. If you actually look at them, then, for instance, uh, serfdom and servile marriage, by definition, they can be equated to slavery. So what's left as far as servitude is concerned is child trafficking and, and debt bondage, which gives the possibility at a certain level that these two can fall into uh, to slavery. So from, from my reading of it, uh, servitude has a very small place uh, in this continuum that, there, that in law, uh, it has a very small space when it comes to, uh, to, to being um, utilized as, as a tool to try to suppress uh, exploitation. The other hand is this distinction between slavery. I've spoken about slavery al already. Um, I have spent a lot of time looking at it uh, with a, a group of, of experts in, in, in the area in property law in the history of slavery. We developed something called the Bellagio Harvard Guidelines. <clears throat> 
And those, I think, uh, help us think about uh, the notion of slavery in a way that, uh, that replicates the lived experience or, or uh, catches the lived experience of contemporary slavery today. And so I think it's, it's helpful. Uh, in essence, and I've mentioned it before, it's about controlling somebody. And then once you control them, then, so control in the sense of possessing something. And so if you want to draw the analogy, let's say, uh, to illegal drugs, right? So in the context of illegal drugs, the judge won't ask who owns it because you can't legally own it in the same way that you can't legally own a person. But the judge will ask who possessed, who controlled. And in the same way, then we, we expect and we would hope that when it comes to slavery, that the judge asks the same question. Who controlled this person? Was that control to the extent that that person had lost agency, had lost their free will? And typically what we'll see is that once that free will is gone, then you can first force the person to do whatever you want. You can buy, sell them. You can even exhaust them to the extent that you work them to death. And so I think there are conceptual differences, but that with regards to servitude, that there is very little legal space in which you can actually talk about servitude today. Courts have struggled with it. Um, I think reference to the 56 probably helps. Uh, and also, ultimately, that forced labor is wide enough to catch uh, other types of exploitation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think it's uh, been so far a uh, very fascinating and, and very rewarding uh, uh, conversation that we've been having here. I truly believe that the protocol and the international human rights framework are our best weapons. We need law. So uh, plans of action and things like that are all very important, but at the end of the day, we need law. And we need conceptual clarity. It's not just a luxury for, for us lawyers with too much time on our hands to, to sit around and debate these issues. It, conceptual, the lack of conceptual clarity contributes to vagueness and uncertainty. And as I've written before, as long as the law remains unclear, states, can and will continue to argue about it. As long as the law remains unclear, they will almost certainly not be brought to task for failing to apply it. And that's where our attention really must be. Thank you. Uh, I think what is critically important is to address the root causes. Uh, that's conveniently forgotten. Uh, and even when root causes, are, there's a pretension to address root causes, it's addressed only within the framework of a safety net. Rehabilitation of the safety net variety is hopelessly inadequate to uh, issues concerning factors in the political economy of the society that aggravates the condition to create more and more of the, all the victims that we are talking of. All the victims. Thank you. And then uh, Mr. Tiago uh, Rivero. Thank you. Well, just to give a short answer, uh, ch uh, child labor is, uh, uh, under Brazilian law, we have is cl clearly addressed in under Brazilian law. We have these policies, we have this law, these laws against uh, child labor, and uh, it's uh, also uh, being developed, these this projects, the programs in to elimination to, first, to child labor. And uh, just to, to conclude my last mes message, uh, we are here debating, discussing uh, around concepts because it's so difficult to previously define the when it comes to the human creativity to develop forms of human exploitation. So, uh, uh, but uh, I think with uh, movements like this, with uh, discussions and with the action from the international community, we will finally uh, can eliminate these forms of exploitation and uh, I think that it's important to say that uh, labor exploitation or other forms of human exploitation are mainly economical issues but uh, the cost of the, the coercion is also our, our idea of civilization and I think that's it and thank you for the invitation. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I want to just thank the panelists for deepening discussion uh, towards conceptual uh, clarification on the trafficking in persons, slavery, servitude, forced labor, bonded labor. Uh, thank you for being part of this debate and for contributing to expanding knowledge in this uh, field. And uh, I will uh, quickly turn on to uh, my colleague, uh, the Special Rapporteur on uh, Contemporary Forms of Slavery, Ms. Gunara, to, to do a brief summary.
Thank you. You put me in a very hard task to, you know, uh, collect all of this information and to present to readers. It's a, it was really exceptional. And I think this is a discussion, this is a process that we have to continue discussing the hard issues that we come across when we work in the field, when we work with legislation and situations that we encounter. In many countries, when I travel, I see the situations that I'm trying to understand how I'm going to apply slavery definition to this, whether this is trafficking, what does it mean? And what is the cultural context of the country, economic context of the country, how I'm going to apply this? This is very, uh, a very, very hard process. And I think we always have to be open, as I was telling in my discussion, open to this, uh, you know, uh, uh, definition, having in, in consideration the uh, very uh, dynamic process we're living in and the very dynamic responses of criminals or people who are exploiting people, you know, exploiters, uh, we have to take into consideration, we have to be open to this. And um, even, uh, you know, when, uh, if, if uh, there is a law, of course, uh, as Anne Gallagher was saying, there is human rights law, there is trafficking law, combination of those elements is extremely important. Some, you cannot apply sometimes only labor law. You have to go beyond that. You have to go beyond criminal law. You have to go beyond migration law in order to have a clear picture. So we're coming to an end of a very intense and informative uh, morning. Uh, and I'd like to very warmly thank our panelists for, for, for really an excellent and captivating panel this morning. Uh, you have showed us very eloquently the incredible complexity of the issue of trafficking and all the forms of explo uh, exploitation. Uh, you showed particularly the, the challenges around uh, definitions and the legal implication of clear, vague, or not having a definition. Um, of course, clear definition is paramount for effective action by states and international organization. But I am tempted to say, maybe here it's more the practitioner, that states and international organizations must not wait for an international agreed clear definition to be active. In parallel to the normative work, they have to be engaged, engaged engineer, I would like to say, in the practical fight against trafficking and exploitation. This fight is also about the political will to act, even under a vague normative regime. Um, thank you also uh, to Special Representative Ezelio for an excellent job as moderator uh, uh, of the panel, and to Special Rapporteur Shahinian for wrapping up the findings of the panel. And now to the continuation of the day, um, I'd like to remind you once again that at 2 p.m. the exhibition starts. Please go and, uh, and see uh, uh, the different booths that are prepared uh, outside about the different form of uh, exploitation. Then also you are all invited at 2.30 to the high-level event just in the room three here, and we will have addresses given by the Swiss Ministry, uh, Minister of Justice and Police, Federal Councillor Simonetta Somahuga. You will have uh, Her Excellency Navi Pillay, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Director General Bill Swing of uh, IOM, um, Greg Wines, Deputy Director of ILO, and uh, Mr. Volker Türk, Acting High Commissioner for Protection at the UNHCR. And now I think we all have deserved a sandwich which is waiting outside um, uh, as we have already time for having our, our lunch. So stay with us, have a sandwich, and thank you again for a great morning. <laughs>